All right, thank you, Pedro. Uh, I'm Fraser Anderson, a research scientist at Autodesk Research, and I'd like to talk to you about some of the work that I've done with Toby and George on making circuits a little easier to build for novices. Um, and I want to give a little context, because I'm stepping up a little bit higher level than some of the other talks. Um, I'm interested in smart objects and how we build smart objects. And they're becoming more prevalent in the world. So from uh, smart lights and thermostats to things like a smart cat fountain. And so this cat fountain is very fancy. It can detect your cat. It can detect up to 48 cats, should you have 48 cats, through various sensors. Uh, and it's built into the uh, fountain itself. It's also got Wi-Fi connectivity. It can sense the amount of water that your cat is drinking to ensure that you've got a healthy, hydrated cat. Uh, and so smart objects like this take a lot of time and effort to build. And oftentimes, uh, people really dig into a project before they realize it's a terrible idea. And this, be sure, is a terrible idea. Um, but whether you're building a terrible idea or a good idea, like a smart light or thermostat, it does take a ton of effort to get to that first prototype, to put it in the hands of a user or a cat, uh, to understand whether or not it's a valuable product. And it's not just smart cat fountains or lights. Um, we see this a lot, whether it's a hobbyist that wants to build a weather station, or a scientist that wants to study the soil moisture, or even in our own domain, building smart watches for new interaction techniques. These all take some technical knowledge, circuitry, software, firmware, things like that, that can be a barrier to entry, so we lose good ideas, or it can be uh, sort of a time commitment, and so we explore bad ideas for far too long. So I'd like to sort of work on this problem. Um, and of course, there's a lot of prior work in this area. Uh, there's a lot of sort of custom hardware modules, so things like the Fidget and .NET Gadgeteer and Circuit Stickers, these are all sort of custom hardware platforms that are approachable for users, they can plug and play, but sometimes you get locked into sort of this walled garden where the particular sensor doesn't fit, or you can't really take your idea that next step further when the prototyping hardware just hits a limit. There is, of course, the Arduino, which has been uh, really great for people to prototype all sorts of ideas. There's a, a really great community. There's a ton of form factors for different applications. Um, but again, you sort of have to look online to figure out what to do. If you're really a novice, you don't know what sensors you need to connect, and you've got to start copying and pasting blocks of code, and you can be kind of lost. And of course, there's sort of a lot of recent work, really great work, uh, at WIST. Um, but a lot of this work focuses on uh, sort of really getting into the metal and close to the hardware. And again, if you're a novice, um, you might not get this far before you just get frustrated and give up. Um, a little bit closer to our work is unifying software and circuitry. So Bjorn's DTools work um, is really great, but again, uses custom hardware. And it's a little bit technical for some users. Uh, at Kai earlier this year, David Lito out of our group presented Pineal, which takes the hardware out of hardware prototyping. So here you have your 3D object, and you use a visual programming language, and instead of dealing with soldering and LEDs and things like that, you use your smartwatch or your smartphone, and that provides the sensing and actuation capabilities for you to prototype your smart device. Um, so before I jump into our solution, I want to talk a little bit about generative design, which is sort of the area that inspired us to come up with trigger action circuits. Um, and with generative design, instead of specifying the details of your solution, what you're doing is you're specifying the problem itself to the computer, and the computer's going and synthesizing solutions for you to choose from. So if you were designing a chair, you'd tell the computer you want it to support this much weight, you only want it to weigh this much, and it should cost this much. Um, and with those basic parameters, a computer can go and synthesize one design, or thousands of designs, or hundreds of thousands of designs, and you, as the creator, get to choose which one is most suitable for you based on aesthetics or other parameters that you might want to consider. And so this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to take this generative design approach, but apply it to this domain of circuits. So we want the user to be able to specify their high-level idea, and then the computer should be able to go and generate the underlying circuitry. Because I think we're at a point where the electronics is um, sort of able to be plug and played, and we don't have to struggle with analog voltages too much anymore for a lot of basic prototyping tasks. And so that leads us to trigger action circuits. This is the system that we developed. Uh, and it's primarily a GUI. So here's what the user would see. Um, I'll walk you through the different stages of it. So in the top left there, that's the authoring canvas for the user. So it, the blue represents triggers and actions. So these are discrete events and actions that the uh, underlying circuitry could take. So um, in this case, it might be a little bit small, but you're mapping three different temperatures of hotter than to different glowing LEDs. So as something heats up, the, glow, the LEDs would glow in sequence. Um, if you look at the bottom in the orange, we also have linear mappings or other sort of mappings from one continuous input to a continuous output. So we get a little bit more expressive while still not overwhelming the user. Um, once we've got the um, 
the behavior defined, uh, the system can then start synthesizing circuits that satisfy that behavior. So it knows about components behind the scenes, it knows about behaviors behind the scenes, and it starts presenting the user with a list of circuits that they can choose from. Um, and they can explore based on the different parameters that they might want to consider, whether it's cost or ease of assembly or difficulty or, or things like that. Um, and as they're exploring, they can select each one um, and then they get to see the circuit diagram. And this gives them sort of a visual understanding of uh, how difficult it might be to assemble or what it might look like in the final uh, assembled stage. Um, we've also got step-by-step -step assembly instructions that are interactive. So as they're clicking uh, the different assembly instructions, um, they can sort of see the highlighted parts of the diagram lit up so they get a sense of how they can assemble this thing. And lastly, it synthesizes the firmware. And they can inspect this and they can modify this. So it kind of serves as a jumping off point if they want to dig farther into the electronics beyond what's synthesized for them. So let me show you just a quick example of how somebody might build uh, a smart temperature alarm with a system like this. So the uh, sort of high level behavior is I want to always see the current temperature. If it's above 40 degrees Celsius, we're in Canada, uh, we'll show a green LED. And if it's above 80 degrees Celsius, I want to sound an audible alarm. Um, so you can see that they're going to start by uh, pausing the video. All right. So they're going to drag uh, heat continuous mapping and map that to the display text. So they'll always see the display text. They add a variable. So they're going to store that heat in a variable. They're adding a discrete trigger on that variable. So when that uh, threshold there is hit, it'll trigger a glow action. They're going to add another trigger variable. So when it hits the other threshold, it's going to play a tone action. And so that's the extent that the user has to specify the behavior. So uh, seven little modules, four little lines, and a few parameter settings. And so now they're exploring the potential circuits, seeing which one might be the most suitable. They've chosen the one that they have the components for, and they're going to assemble it following the interactive assembly instructions. They upload the firmware right from the software. And now they will test it by lighting the sensor on fire. And so at 40 degrees, the LED lights up. And at 80, we get a tone. So that's the general overview of how you might use the system to, to build a, a somewhat complicated example. I'll go through a couple other uh, examples to give you a sense for how robust the system is. And so to validate this, what we did was we looked at the Arduino starter kit, which represents sort of a, a, wide, range of, a wide range of sensing and actuation as well as logic flow examples. So it really, really represents sort of the beginner level of how you might start programming with circuits. Um, and so this is one of the projects from the starter kit, and it's a light theremin. So you use a light sensor, and you move your hand up and down over the light sensor. And as that value changes, the pitch that's being played by the buzzer also changes. So with trigger action circuits on the left, what they do is they do a continuous mapping from brightness to sound pitch. And again, that's all the user has to uh, specify. And then the resultant circuitry is below that. And you can see that the resultant circuitry for trigger action circuits is actually pretty similar to what's presented in the Arduino starter kit, which is sort of a curated, um, expert-designed example. Uh, and in terms of code, the, the effort to you know, put two icons together and, and link them is much less than if you were to type all that out with the Arduino starter kit. Looking at another example from the starter kit, um, this is a LED spaceship. I forget exactly what the title is, but the gist is if you're not pressing a button, a single LED is glowing. And when you do press the button, two LEDs alternate flashing. Um, and so it takes a little bit more work with the visual programming language than our prior example, but it's still pretty simple and easy to follow. Uh, and you can see that while the wiring is a little bit more messy in terms of layout, the actual pin assignments and connections are pretty similar between the trigger action circuits and the starter kit. And again, with, um, I would argue, a little bit less effort to design the circuit. So we can do some pretty flexible stuff, uh, especially if you consider that a novice doesn't need a whole lot of um, knowledge beforehand to do this. Um, and so the way that we're doing this is actually pretty simple. So behaviors are represented in a flat text file. Um, and this is really nice because it allows anybody with Arduino expertise to sort of add new behaviors. Uh, and if you want to do that, all you need is a behavior name, um, what components that this behavior requires, uh, a list of parameters, and the parameters are things that are maybe set by the user. So in the prior case, it was the temperature thresholds. 
Um, they might be set by the device or the component. So the component might specify a mapping between the voltage reported and a temperature in Celsius. Um, and then there's also parameters that are set by the system as it's doing the sort of circuit generation. So it tells the uh, software which pins the different sensors and actuators are connected to. And then, of course, you need the code snippets. These are little templates that actually specify the behavior of the behavior. And these are written in uh, Arduino code with a few little modifications for variable replacement and things like that. Um, similarly, the component representation is sort of equally accessible in a flat text file. Uh, you specify the type of component, whether it's a button, a temperature sensor, resistor, things like that. Um, you can also specify it needs some auxiliary components, so if it needs a pull-up resistor or a filtering capacitor. Um, and then you list the electronic terminals, so the type of terminal, whether it's digital, analog, in or out. Um, you give it a name if it's going to be used in software later by one of these behaviors. And then is it required or not? Um, and so this seems a little bit weird, but you have things like an Arduino that have 40 pins or something, and not all of them need to be connected to something in order for the system to, to function. And so once you have all of these sort of database of components and behaviors, um, the dependency resolution is actually pretty straightforward. Um, for each behavior, you find all the necessary components. For each of those components, you see if they have more components that they need, and you get those two. Um, then the system can go through and do a pin assignment and figure out where all of these things should be connected to the Arduino and to each other. Uh, and then you can go through and replace in all of those code templates the user parameters, the system parameters, uh, and any other sort of assigned pins that, that were uh, done during the dependency resolution. And so that's really it. Like, it's not a crazy complicated system, um, but it's able to do quite a bit. Uh, but even though it is sort of flexible and uh, we're pretty confident that it's, it's useful, we still wanted to get some feedback on how well novice users could use it. Um, so we ran a a study with a level meter. Uh, and so this wasn't arbitrary. There's a really nice paper in CHI 2016 by Tracy Booth that looked at uh, the problems that people had when they're assembling Arduino circuits. And this was a task they used, and they gave them 45 minutes. Um, and we contacted her and got the procedure. Um, and so we borrowed that task, and we split it up into two groups. One of them replicated uh, their study, where they were giving participants the components that they need, um, the general overview of the circuit, uh, and then 45 minutes with the internet to figure out how to assemble the circuit. And then the other group of people uh, got our system and the same sort of instructions. So when you put your finger over a temperature sensor, we want these LEDs to light up in sequence. And so the results, uh, while we're not surprised that our system was faster, we were surprised at how much faster. Um, none of the people in the Arduino condition were able to finish in the 45 minutes, which we were a little bit surprised about. Um, whereas everybody with the trigger action circuit system was able to finish. Um, but it's a little bit more interesting than that, and that is how people approach the problem. Uh, with the Arduino condition, the participants would take the larger problem and sort of break it down into smaller problems, try to solve those, and then try to integrate them. Whereas with, the, with our system, all the design was sort of upfront before they even started with the hardware. And so that led to some sort of interesting uh, results. So this is an example of one of the subtasks uh, that somebody without our system ended up doing. Um, his mental model was, I need this LED to light up. So he looked up how to light up an LED with an Arduino, and he came across this solution. And so we built this, and this is connecting the LED to the ground, the 5 volts of the resistor. And then he tried to integrate this back into his program, but he couldn't control it. Yes, the LED was lighting up, but he couldn't you know, sort of integrate that back into his temperature sensing. So he had to sort of pull that all apart and start from scratch. Um, and so he made this error, and he made it because he was subdividing the task wrong and learning as he was going. Um, and that sort of leads us to some takeaways uh, about this approach in general. Um, that person did make a mistake, but he learned. He learned about how the Arduino operates. He learned a little bit about voltage, whereas people with our condition, they were sort of designing at a high level and then just following instructions. Um, and so they did get it done faster, but I think they really didn't learn as much. They didn't take anything away um, in terms of being able to build a brand new circuit on their own later. Um, and so that's something important to consider. For a lot of people, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe they just want to get something done uh, and test it out. But for other people, um, it's maybe more of a hobby, and they want to really feel like they've put some effort into building their, their, their device. Um, the other sort of uh, takeaway that we got was a few of the people commented that the, the circuit selection was a little bit intimidating. 
or confusing. So they build their circuit and they made their visual programming language and they were presented with a hundred circuit options and they had no idea which one to pick. Um, they could scroll through and they could pick the cheapest one, but there was all these other parameters they weren't considering. Um, and I think that's an important problem with the generative design approach in general. If you're synthesizing a thousand options, each with a hundred parameters, it's really hard to navigate the space and find the one that you want. Um, and so for some approaches, maybe you want to filter this down. Maybe you don't want to give them all these options. You just want to synthesize one circuit that works. Um, but for other uh, use cases, maybe you do want to give them the full flexibility. And that sort of leads to other opportunities with this approach beyond novices. Um, experts might use it to find alternatives that are cheaper, more reliable, or better suited to their task. So they can have this sense of, you know, I want this circuit, but I don't want it in this mode, and then they can filter out uh, and get an equivalent circuit maybe with a few different components. And then the other nice thing is if we know about the components that they're using with prototyping, we can use the through hole components like the ones on the left that fit in a breadboard, but then we can just swap to maybe manufacturable surface mount components when they go to manufacture. And we already know that the specs are the same and the prototypes might switch more easily to a manufactured deployable prototype. Um, so I just want to conclude by saying I think a lot of good ideas um, are maybe stopped because people don't have the technical knowledge or maybe they're intimidated by secret, uh, the you know, technical challenges with circuitry, and a lot of bad ideas require a ton of work and maybe people feel committed to completing them. And I think if we can close this gap with higher level authoring software, I think we can do a little bit better and get better objects for us and the people we work with. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Fraser. Um, come to the mic if you have questions. If not, I'll get started with one. I really enjoyed the, I mean, not the cat prototype thing, but I really enjoyed the, the motivation of a high level kind of generative design thing. And I was wondering, I mean, when you're designing chairs or visual objects and, and the computer synthesizes a thousand objects, then for you, it's kind of an aesthetic thing that you're going to pick from. But here, how do you expect the ver different variations to provide or what do they afford? You know, like, mm -hmm. what am I going to choose from? Is it wearability or is it just cost in the end of the day? What are, what are the things that you're... Yeah, so I think that that's really dependent on what the user wants to do. Like, if I'm building a mobile device, I want to test a new, a new smartwatch thing, then maybe size and, like, overall volume of the components is going to be a lot more important to me than how much they cost because I've got a big, you know, research grant or something. But for other people, maybe they just want to use the components on hand. And so uh, in the system, we do maintain a list of what components you might have in your, your library already so you can rapidly prototype. And, um, you know, in the paper, you can look and see the sort of, you know, first pass at the parameters that we think users might be interested in. Um, but I think, you know, as it grows, each user might find a new thing that they might care about, whether it's power consumption or affordability or assembly time or something like that. Well, power consumption is a really cool one. Yeah. I like that. Questions, anyone? <laughs>